the 26th of February, 1966. The last rites of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, a man who never sought fame or position, a man to whom death had little meaning, one who believed that the spirit of man is indomitable. Savarkar was born at a time when the echoes of 1857 were still in the air, an uprising which he was to explicitly define as India's first war of independence. <laughs> British imperialism had all but dominated the subcontinent when in the village of Bhagur near Nasik on the 28th of May 1883, it was in this house that Savarkar was born. He was to embody the spiritual revival initiated by Swami Dayanand and the revolutionary fervor of Vasudev Balwan Fadke, both of whom died at about this time. At school and at home, the young Vinayak was brought up not only on epics such as the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, but on the courage and love of freedom of men such as Rana Pratap and Shivaji. Even as a child, Vinayak read newspapers to know what was happening in the world around him. In 1897, a plague epidemic struck Western India. The plague could not have come at a worse time because famine starved the land. While efforts were made to contain the epidemic, there were many instances of unwarranted cruelty by the British authorities. Houses and belongings were burnt indiscriminately and people were evicted and dragged away from their homes without any sympathy. Bal Gangadhar Tilak in the Marathi newspaper Kesari asked in bold headlines whether the government had lost its reason. The silence of terror ruled the cities and towns. There was a great outcry against the special plague commissioner, W.C. Rand, who instead of working in the plague-ridden areas, preferred to spend his time at government house, especially while celebrating Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Returning from the celebrations after midnight, Rand and Lieutenant Irist were shot dead. The killers, the Chapekar brothers, were caught and hanged. The effect on Vinayak was one of indignation and rage. The young boy took a vow. I will fight unto death for the freedom of my country. Savarkar wrote a stirring poem on the martyrdom which was published and widely read. People found it hard to believe 
that a 15-year-old boy could write such a moving poem. Moreover, they were astounded to discover that the youngster was also an effective orator. In Nasik, whereas the crowds went to pray, Savarkar came to pay homage to this bell, which was captured by the Marathas from the Portuguese in a bitterly fought battle. It was in Nasik that Vinayak began his secondary education. With his newfound purpose, he joined his elder brother, Baba Rao Savarkar, to start the Abhinav Bharat, a group devoted to shaping a rejuvenated India. From an original gathering of five, the movement spread rapidly to different parts of the country. The Abhinav Bharat believed in total freedom. Each individual could contribute to their goal in different ways, by writing, by arousing, by publication, by revolution, and martyrdom. After matriculating in 1902, Vinayak went to the Ferguson College in Pune. This is the room he occupied in the college hostel. Apart from the books prescribed in the curriculum and the English classics, Savarkar studied Indian culture and history in great depth. Here again, Savarkar introduced the Abhinav Bharat. In spite of the fact that the college authorities disapproved of political discussion, Savarkar encouraged and indeed promoted it. As a student leader, Savarkar often called on Tilak for discussion and guidance. In 1905, every political leader was apprehensive about the impending partition of Bengal. The people of India reacted strongly. Savarkar and his fellow students organized a bonfire to burn cloth from Lancashire. This symbolic burning of the British Raj upset the college principal who fined Savarkar 10 rupees and had him turned out of the hostel. Tilak denounced the college authorities. They don't deserve to be our teachers. At about this time, Savarkar came to know of a patriot living in England, Shamji Krishna Varma, who was offering scholarships to dedicated young people. Savarkar decided to apply. My dear Pandit Shamji, according to your instructions, I enclose herewith the agreement on stamp paper signed by Mr. Savarkar as per your draft. I remain yours sincerely, Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Even as Savarkar sailed for England, the special department of the government sent a confidential warning to the India office in London to keep an eye on the activities of the young firebrand. Savarkar had made it clear in his scholarship application that he would go to England not only to become a barrister, but basically to continue his fight for India's freedom. This building in Highgate in London was named Bharat Bhavan, India House, by Shamji Verma. 
Savarkar lived here and began to read for the bar at Gray's Inn. Never one to waste time, Savarkar promptly started to recruit people for the Abhinav Bharat, many of whom were later to make history. In 1907, while the government observed the 50th anniversary of the crushing of the mutiny and the saving of the British Empire, Savarkar celebrated the occasion as the Indian National Rising of 1857. People whom the British thought of as rebels were recognized as national heroes. Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Rani of Jhansi, Nana Saheb Peshwa, Tatia Tope, Raja Kumar Singh and other martyrs. It was in this India house that the flag of a free India was designed. Savarkar gave the flag to Madame Bhikaiji Kama and Sardar Singh Rana to take to the International Socialist Conference at Stuttgart in 1907. Madame Kama's appeal to free one-fifth of the human race from the bondage of imperialism evoked a tremendous response from the socialist leaders of the world. In India, fearing a wave of revolt, the British closed down presses and imprisoned national leaders. The repression in Punjab was particularly brutal. Reacting to this violence, at the Imperial Institute in London, a member of the Abhinav Bharat, Madan Lal Dhingra shot Sir Curzon Wiley, the most powerful man in the India office. Dhingra was imprisoned and hanged in Pentonville prison. Before he died, Dhingra said of his country, my wish is that I should be born again of the same mother and that I should die the same death for her again. Winston Churchill said of Dhingra's last words that they were among the finest ever spoken in the name of patriotism. India House was closed down and Savarkar and his friends went away from London. At Brighton, Savarkar wrote a poem which expresses the longings of perhaps every revolutionary in exile. He appeals to the great ocean to carry him back to the peace of his motherland. <laughs> Pahu
Back in London, Savarkar continued his self-appointed task. Whenever he could get away from Gray's Inn, he read all he could of colonial history, through the ages from Roman times to the British. At the India Office Library, he managed to get access to confidential correspondence and military dispatches between India and London. After exhaustive research spread over nearly two years, he wrote the first historically authenticated account of the Indian War of Independence, 1857. The secret services had kept a close watch on Savarkar, and his book was, if not the first, certainly a very rare example in the history of literature of a work being proscribed before its publication. The book continued to be officially proscribed until India finally became independent 38 years later. The book was clandestinely published in Holland, bound in covers purporting to be the works of Charles Dickens and Walter Scott. It was translated into French, German, several Indian languages, and was smuggled to many countries of the world. Meanwhile in India, Vinayak's brother Baba Rao Savarkar had published a collection of poems urging total revolution. He was arrested in Nasik and condemned to transportation for life. Vinayak's younger brother Narayan Rao was also arrested and imprisoned for promoting the idea of freedom. In retaliation against the savage treatment meted out to revolutionaries, the collector of Nasik, A.M.T. Jackson, was shot dead by Anand Kanere. Kanere was hanged. It was established that the pistol was sent to India in a book by Savarkar from London. On his arrival at Victoria Station from Paris in March of 1910, Savarkar was arrested. He was detained in Brixton Jail. It is interesting to note that whereas England had sheltered Mazzini, Karl Marx, Garibaldi, Kossuth, Lenin and other revolutionaries, De Valera and Savarkar were treated differently because they were under British rule. Savarkar was shipped out to be tried in India. In Marseille, Savarkar eluded his guards and in the early hours swam ashore. He was arrested and taken back to the ship. This led to the famous Affaire Savarkar, an arbitration case before the International Court of Justice at The Hague, where France claimed that Britain had no right to take Savarkar out of French jurisdiction. However, by this time, the High Court of Bombay indulged in a remarkable travesty of the British rule of law. There was no jury at the so-called trial of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar and he was denied any right of appeal. A special tribunal was hastily appointed even though France and England were still arguing the question of jurisdiction at The Hague. The charges were those of waging war against the Crown, of abetting the murder of Jackson and of sedition. It is noteworthy that there is no record of this mockery of a trial in the law reports. Savarkar's property was confiscated and he was sentenced to imprisonment for life, not once, but twice over. The British gave Savarkar the honor of taking him to Port Blair in the Andaman Islands in the SS Maharaja although the conditions in which he travelled was not exactly royal.
The Andamans were the devil's island of the British Raj. To be sent here across the Kalapani, the black water, meant never to be returned to life. The very entrance of the cellular jail was designed to frighten the life out of a convict. When Savarkar arrived, not a single prisoner was allowed to see him. There was constant fear of Savarkar's volcanic presence. It is a terrible irony that Vinayak did not know that his elder brother Baba Rao was also imprisoned here at the time of his arrival. He had known that he was in prison but not where. It was only six to eight months later that he was to know of his brother's presence. His younger brother Narayan Rao was also in jail on the mainland. The three of them, brothers in life, brothers in prison, brothers in the cause of freedom. But tragedy and sorrow were never to overshadow Savarkar's spirit. In the extremes of solitude, he was beginning to develop an inner strength, a spiritual defiance of all that the material power of an empire could do to him. The chains and confines of prison meant nothing. His mind was free to be with his God, to be with his great love, his motherland. हास करित जई धर्म धारणी मृत्यु सीच गाठ घालू मी घुसे रणी अग्नि जाली मज सीना खड़ग छे दितो भिवनी मला भ्याड मृत्यु पलत सूट तो खुला रिपू तया स्वये मृत्यु चाची भीती ने भिवव मज सीए भिवव मज सीए अनादिमी अनंतमी अवध्यमी A life sentence in those days usually meant 25 years. So Savarkar had 50 years of incarceration to look forward to. To begin with, he was placed in solitary confinement for six months, a measure designed to demoralize him. To heap indignity on solitude, he was informed that the Senate of the University of Bombay had withdrawn his degree of Bachelor of Arts, an act of petty viciousness which caused many Britishers to hang their heads in shame.
At no time was Savarkar treated as a political prisoner, always as a criminal. During the Delhi Darbar in 1911, to celebrate the coronation of George V and Queen Mary, while officers of the Raj and Indian toadies paid homage to the crown, freedom fighters seem to have been forgotten, but not entirely. On this august occasion, while many prisoners were released and others had their sentences remitted, not so Baba Rao and Vinayak Savarkar. No doors opened for them. On the contrary, Vinayak was kept in a cell from which he was compelled to suffer the sight of the brutality of his captor. Vinayak was kept in crossbar fetters, a system unknown in India, a barbaric punishment for minor infractions of prison rules. He was handcuffed and kept standing for seven days because a note from another prisoner was found in his cell. Savarkar himself has described the solitary monotony of many years in a cell. And yet while his body lay shackled, his mind roamed across the seas, climbing hills, flitting like a bee among flowers, searching for visions of those close to his heart, marveling at the beauty of God and the infinite variety and epic vastness of India's history. He scratched poems on the walls, because the walls were periodically whitewashed and the poems he wrote were obliterated. He committed them to memory, a prodigious task, for he composed more than 10,000 verses during his years in jail in the Andaman. After eight years, Vinayak finally met his wife Yamunabai and his brother Narayan Rao. They had traveled 1500 miles to see him for 60 minutes on one day and 75 minutes on the next. He received news of the death of Baba Rao's wife, Yashubai, who was as dear as a sister to him. She died neglected because she was the wife of a convict an unsung martyr. One form of punishment for rudeness to a jailer was to have to extract 30 pounds of oil a day. Savarkar was only one of hundreds of revolutionaries who suffered inhuman treatment. Who can measure their contribution to the freedom we enjoy today? Among others, Maxim Gorky wrote of Savarkar and his colleagues that they generated a new spirit of hope which was making obsolete the English regime on the banks of the Ganges. The poor food and the harsh punishment inflicted upon him was too much even for Savarkar's strength. He collapsed.
lying in the sick bay when death seemed imminent. He yet summoned up reserves of determination, for he refused to give in. How could he die before he saw his country free? of August 1920, Bal Gangadhar Tilak died in Bombay. When the news reached Fort Blair, Savarkar organized a day of fasting in tribute to the great leader. Not a single prisoner touched his food that day. There was a demand throughout India and in other countries for the release of the Savarkars. The British authorities decided to transfer Baba Rao and Binayak to the mainland. Vinayak was brought to Ratnagiri, to another top security jail. Here he was given some amenities. His first action was to put down on paper the thousands of verses he had composed and memorized in the Andaman. <laughs> Nakhare vare sevari, a sindhu sindhu pariyanta, yasya bharata bhoomika, pitru bho punya bhooshchaiva, savai hindu riti smrtaha, ahaya sujha, gora gata chigana, chari viraha vedana prana, In 1924, Savarkar was released on condition that he should not leave Ratnagiri district and that he should not indulge in any political activity. A breach of these conditions would make him liable to imprisonment again. Savakar decided to devote himself to social welfare, especially to attack the narrow-minded practices of orthodox Hinduism. Untouchable children were kept out of classrooms. Savarkar's solution was typically radical. Integrate them. He asked his wife, Yamutai, to call the women of the neighborhood, irrespective of caste, for holding the Haldi Kunku ceremony. After centuries of neglect, outcast children and women began to feel that someone cared for them. Oh, Mahadeva Ji, Pita, 
Savarkar opened for Harijans the temples hitherto closed to them. Savarkar contributed to the simplification and precision of the Devanath script. He arranged and encouraged inter-caste eating to break down caste barriers, a movement which spread and came to be called Saha Bhojan. In 1927, Gandhi came to Ratnagiri and called on Savarkar, who lived opposite to the house where Tilak was born. They were meeting for the first time since Savarkar's student days in London. In his house in Ratnagiri, Savarkar devoted himself to writing. He wrote his memoirs, he wrote on Hindu philosophy, he wrote plays and many works devoted to the restructuring of society and the equality among people necessary for a viable civilization. At last, in 1937, Savarkar was released unconditionally. The day of his release, the 10th of May, was coincidentally the date on which India's first war of independence began. On acquiring freedom of movement, Savarkar undertook a long journey to every part of India. He was received by huge and enthusiastic crowds not only as a Hindu reformer, but as a foremost patriot and revolutionary. Savarkar had a clear idea of his view of the future. While fighting against the British Raj, he said, before you destroy anything, you must know what you are going to construct in its place. He said, India must be independent. India must be united. India must be republic. India must have a common language and common script. And that language should be Hindi and that script should be Nagari. That republic should be a national form of government in which sovereign power rests ultimately and uncompromisingly in the hands of the Indian people. When the Second World War broke out, Savarkar saw an opportunity to militarize the youth of India. He felt that a trained and disciplined force would be able to choose the direction in which to point their guns. It is not the gun that fights, but the hand behind it, and not even the hand, but the heart behind it. In June of 1940, Subhash Chandra Bose conferred with Savarkar in Bombay. The details of that meeting are not known, but it is a fact that Subhash Bose's idea of a military insurrection became known only after that date. The Indian National Army, led by Subhash Chandra Bose, first hoisted the flag of freedom on Indian soil. Fittingly, the flag was first flown over Port Blair in the Andamans, where India's revolutionaries had suffered and died. The British left India. Freedom had arrived at last. Vinayak Damodar Savarkar was for the first time in his life a profoundly happy man. <laughs> 